But just before you start, for those that don't know me already, uh, my name is Daryl Mead. I'm the head of employee experience at Emperor. And uh, essentially, I look after and support our clients around culture, values, employer brand, EVP, communications, anything to do with supporting and creating great workplaces. And I'd like to introduce uh, Kirsty Bashford. Uh, Kirsty is founder and CEO of Keith Fard Limited and uh, is a non exec director of Serco, PV Cousins, Care Group, and Thea Verum. Um, and Kirsty's had 24 years' experience at BP. Uh, maybe, Kirsty, you want to talk a, bit, a little bit about that? Yeah, good morning, everybody, or wherever you are. Um, yeah, I was at BP 1991 until 2015, and um, part of my final five years there was leading the um, reset of BP's culture in the aftermath of the Deepwater Horizon uh, accident and Macondo well blowout. Uh, so quite a lot of experience of um, working with the top team uh, in the middle of a crisis and beyond. And then I, uh, I have re uh, I have written a book called Culture Shift on that, uh, well, not just on that experience, but um, around the business model that I now operate in my own business, which is where I advise companies on organizational culture. So it's great to be here today. I just want to offer some thoughts, no right answers, just questions, thoughts, and ideas. So before we start uh, today's format, just to uh, give you a few guides here. Um, so the event is being recorded, so we'll be able to share it with you uh, later or anybody that, any colleagues that might be interested. Please mute your mic when you're not speaking. Um, we'll open up for questions and discussion a bit later on, and we will stop the recording at the end so we have a chatting house rule period if there's anything that you want to take off the record. And as I said, we'll be making the available recording, uh, materials available uh, after the event. So let's um, crack on. I thought I'd just put this slide up here is who was with us today, because we had a really um, big range of people kind of sign up for this. And it's interesting when you see those roles there, quite a broad range of roles. And I think last year when we did our culture club sessions, uh, we talked about culture being shifted from an HR leg right into the C-suite, being a strategic opportunity. And I think this, uh, the, the people who have signed up and joining the session today is an indication that it is more joined up. It's really about um, strategy at the top of the business. And culture is a competitive advantage. So especially now when companies are starting to think a bit more coordinated about a strategic response and what next. So what are we discussing today? So we've got three kind of core, core topics. I'm going to start with people and culture at the core, looking at the importance of people and culture. Then have a look at operating through, through your culture and you know, the kinds of things that you need to consider um, as culture is central to how you operate your business. And then uh, thirdly, we're going to look at uh, moving, looking back and thinking about what can you learn from this period, but moving beyond and what, what does the next phase and what does recovery and rebuilding business look like in terms of culture. So, Kirsty, let's start with um, people and culture at the core. Yeah, um, I think it's interesting. If we look back to um, earlier in the year and how much has changed, I mean, for many people on this web webinar, People and culture has been your bread and butter, has been at the core of what you do and how you think about business driving. And for many organizations, they've always said, people first, that's what we do. But in reality, when you're the very top team of an organization, how often are people and culture at the very top of your weekly agenda, daily agenda? You know, we've often seen it, haven't we, where it's at uh, the AOB part of the, the agenda, or it's that, well, we haven't got time to cover the people thing today. And how often do we have culture right at the heart of the, uh, of the meeting agenda or at the top up there with operations? Uh, and yet fast forward to today, it's everybody's business. It's every CEO's and boards, and I'm on four boards. I can tell you it's all of our top issue. Um, and it's gone from people first in parenthesis to people first and associated that with culture. So we thought we wanted to offer some, some ideas on that. And, and so in a nutshell, you know, what was already core cool for some, in my view, has now become everyone's imperative. How long that will last for at the top of everybody's agenda once we're through this, who knows? For some it will become it and it will remain, but it won't for everybody. But for now, it is absolutely everyone's imperative. It's no longer regarded as HR or comms's world. Um, and a, a reflection for me is around um, Maslow's hierarchy. I mean, everybody's culture is about the identity and belonging and traits that that organization needs to have to deliver its, its strategy. But at the foundation of it, we've got to go right back 
to the first levels of Maslow's hierarchy, where it's about safety and shelter um, for everybody. We've had to go back to the basics. You see the government policies on obviously on social and economic, and for businesses, it's about how safe is it for people to work and, and how do we keep people going? So, I, you know, that to me is, is, is a really, really important thing we've been going to look at at the moment. Daryl. So um, a tsunami of elephants, um, you know, I, it's interesting. Nobody is left unaffected by uh, the COVID-19. And I think it's interesting, no two companies or individuals are affected in the same way. But um, when we've looked at the kinds of things that organizations are dealing with now, you know, we've had to call on all sorts of uh, skills and experience in terms of the change that's happened. You know, it's uh, affected policies, the number of people, every single employee in every organization is impacted. Um, a number of people have been furloughed and that's uh, extended and could extend even further. Um, work environments, you know, the challenge of kind of socially connected versus physically isolated, you know, the whole work experience has changed for people. Um, health and well-being, uh, as Kirsty mentioned, like psychological safety is really critical at the moment for employees, you know, are they included? Are they safe to learn and feel safe to contribute and also challenge the status quo? Um, Safety, obviously, uh, you know, health and safety, keeping people well, and wellness is right at the top of the agenda. Um, communications, uh, obviously, are, are key, and that's changed measurably in the last few months. I've never seen so much change in all those all those areas that uh, we had kind of had barriers for video calling, remote working, and trust in the workplace, and how do we connect with remote employees? That's all kind of happened, and it's been fixed, and everybody's just getting on with it. But so what is the next stage? Yeah, and just to, to build on that, um, for me, you know, there is no single similar context for any organization. While everybody is having to do these elements, everybody's context is different. And just, for example, on the boards that I'm on, uh, just to give you an example of the different sorts of challenges while everybody is working through these. You know, for, for, for Circo, where I'm on the board, the, the challenge is, is whether it's you can source enough PPE around the world for all of your different government services where it's, it's trying to find enough people for some contracts that are being stood up. You know, if, you, if the government says you need more people, 500 more people to man the 111 line, you've got to go and find the people, make sure they're safe, set them up. So that's an example. For Kia, um, where I'm also on the board, which is all about um, construction and services and infrastructure, it's, you know, the government says, let's keep some of the economy going, some vital services like building and infrastructure. It's how do you make sure that when you've got people on sites, they are um, working to the right distancing so that that's safe. And how do you do that across the industry? For Dia Verum, where I'm on the board, where it's about um, that they run clinics of kidney dialysis across the world. That is a whole different world of business continuity planning and crisis management because you have particularly vulnerable clients. Um, with loads of comorbidities, so that's a whole different set of challenge. And then for PZ Cousins, where I'm on the board, where you have different markets with different evolutions, like Nigeria or Indonesia, it's how are you working globally with a set of standard guidelines, but you may be operating in societies where they are set up in a different way, or the government may have a different mindset, or you might be in different times of evolution of this crisis. So it, it's what, we're, what I'm certainly observing is everybody's challenge is very different, but there are some basics that everybody's having to do, but in a different way and different intensity and timing. Absolutely. And I, and I think it's exposed some frailties in business as well and, and, and three key areas. Key areas. Um, firstly, I'd like to talk about board preparedness. You know, interesting, we, I had a look and talked to our reporting team around, are any clients thinking and have identified COVID-19 as, as a risk so far? And there were a few that had identified COVID kind of early, the December year end of reporting clients have, have obviously identified as a principal risk and, and some are now obviously incorporating the pandemic as a, as a broader risk and obviously COVID as an emerging risk. And I, I think the, the point around that is culture is now considered and should be a key business risk and how people respond and how businesses and boards prepare themselves for anything like this in any uh, shape or form. Yeah, and on this one as well, frailties exposed. Um, it, it's really struck me that, you know, many businesses have gone straight into the business continuity planning, crisis management, and to a certain extent, an awful lot of really good plans have been pulled off the shelves and, and gone into action. And I think, you know, there's a scale of people who were more prepared, less prepared. 
But it's really struck me that a lot of those plans have gone into action and worked well, but they are quite functional plans. They're based off having to work like that maybe three days, four days, not six weeks, not perhaps a new way of working forever. And they didn't always focus on the behavioral side. So can we stand up a call center? Can we protect our data? Can we operate in a different way? You know, move within 24 hours? Yes. Can we work, find our ways of working that we're really productive for six weeks? And, and so not everybody has. And it's really struck me that um, often some of the most senior leaders have struggled the most. It, it's a lot of other colleagues right around the organization who are reacting really well to this. And I've seen leaders be surprised that people are productive because they themselves are sometimes struggling to use the technology or to work in a different way. And, and I see some slight generational shifts and more often than not, the older generations are, are, are leading. So that's a bit of a frailty exposed. Mm. I've also seen some mentalities around in different countries it doesn't impact me yet, so I'm maybe not going to play ball. And so there's some mindset challenges on, on frailties. Um, and I've also seen some really, really bad traits of cultures emerging, but some really great deep-seated um, cultural traits emerging. And I would advise anybody to, to take a look at those and be really conscious of them. For example, when I remember back to it's now 10 years ago that the Deepwater Horizon accident happened. Um, one of the current the, the, the traits that really did emerge from deep within the inside BP was actually the sense of courage, individuals' courage, and I think an also an organisational courage to ask for the right help and to get going. And it emerged then that it became one of the values of the company. So um, sometimes in these situations, you see deep-seated traits that are real strengths that emerge, as well as some of the bad ones. And uh, environmental, social and governance, ESG, is uh, you know, also right at the top of the corporate agenda. And a lot of our clients are talking about this at the moment. So, so Kirsty, where do you think culture fits within this? Well, it's really interesting, Dara, because um, before, before this happened, ESG was on the front of everybody's lips. And certainly with Emperor, you know, you guys were, were doing an awful lot of work on it. And there's funds and regulators, everybody looking at it. But it, it, it really um, hit home to me the variety of definitions and understanding that people have when this hit. Um, for some, I've heard people say, oh, it was a fad, it's gone away. And, it, and in it, it, my insight is that some people were still thinking of this as purely environmental cli you know, climate. Whereas actually what we've got is the S and the G in full flow. Um, and culture goes right the way through them. How we act, how we behave, how we decide. And you see the social side, whether we're working with communities, for example, Peace Ed Cousins run on the board, um, you know, CareX can't produce enough CareX, but actually working with some of the vulnerable communities in which the company operates to provide them with some of that. So whether it's communities, whether it's how companies are working with their partners, their suppliers to, to deliver what they need to deliver, or whether it's our employees, social is on big, you know, big front of headline. And on the governance side, Again, coming down to culture of companies, um, some real challenges there that people are having to think through. So when you look at company level, people are always asked to be tra very tr um, transparent on their results. So they're being asked for guidance about full year results. Quite frankly, which company right now has a clue by the end of the year what guidance they can give on their profit? They haven't got a clue. And if anybody says they absolutely can, I sort of don't believe them. So there's a challenge there, but it's full front of mind. We're always told in the governance world that stakeholders must have a voice. Well, the AGM season for so many companies who had end of year in 2019, uh, December 2019, is upon us. How do you do an AGM when you have to social distance and you can't work in offices? You have to do it online. How do you ensure that the voice of the shareholder is properly re represented? There's challenges there. And then there's also the whole code of conduct about how a company operates when things have to get done in a rush. You have to have extra focus on that governance to make sure things are documented. The absolute integrity is maintained. And no matter how well-intentioned things are, they get done properly. So I see ESG in full flow, absolute full flow, particularly on the S&G side with culture, a core thread running through it. Yeah, that's interesting because I was speaking to a two clients in the last couple of weeks who have actually fast-tracked their code of conduct work because they realised that there were some gaps in those and they hadn't really... Um, you know, thought it through and like in context of where they are at the moment. So it's exactly. really interesting. Yeah.
Um, operating through your culture, what does this mean, Kirsty? Um, well, you know, with our with decisions, pace, unprecedented and having to make unprecedented sorts of decisions, and yet we're all distributed. Now, for global companies, people have been distributed, but you were always gathered in pockets. And I think now more than ever, I mean, we all know, it, it, people on this webinar will all know that you, you have to operate through your culture to, to deliver what you need to deliver. But for some, they haven't maybe thought about that as in so much of a focus, and yet now it may be one of the only things you can do to really be visible, to get some sort of consistency. Mm. So we wanted to offer a few thoughts on, on how that might get done. Certainly. Um, and values. I think values are a vital shorthand to how your you know, organisation operates. And, and they've always been and should be the guiding compass, a kind of a North Star moral compass that helps shape how you do things every day. Um, Galvanise around meaning. So, you know, what does it mean to work there? What are the behaviours? You know, what do you expect of people? What, you know, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable? What are the rules? How do you navigate the grey areas where values really come into their play? And it's about consistency as well. Um, values need to be lined up with strategy, business strategy as well, to make sure that how people behave is actually how you deliver your uh, business and your initiatives and take action. Um, so I think it's really important at the moment to think about uh, how have your values worked in the last few weeks? And you're thinking about all those human um, values around collaboration and connection, those more real human uh, attributes. Um, do they really fit? You know, are they part of your value set? Um, how are you doing this? Um, when we say, uh, I like to put the word we value in front of your values, and you know, we value integrity. Well, what does that actually mean in context of what you've been doing and how you've been working? You know, and do they really represent your values? Um, but it's interesting, there's, there's three that have kind of stuck out, I've seen that have, have really come to the fore around creativity, innovation and resilience. Uh, creativity is right up at the moment. Employees are coming up with all sorts of new ways and ideas to connect and, and share and connect with other employees and share their work. Um, and innovation, you know, new ideas, we start an ideas centre just to capture all the stuff because I was bombarded with, oh, we should do this, what about we think about this? So, you know, capture those in a way to either share them back and drive your business. Yeah, and back, just back to what we said at the start about Maslow's hierarchy, you know, there's the shelter and safety and well-being. Then there's, that, as Daryl says, there's this emergence of, of beyond that of those basics, what are the, some of the, the, the deep core human values that are emerging. And then there's the values that really distinctively distinguish your company and how you need to operate to deliver a strategy. And I see a sort of flow of levels um, but, but something that is a real shorthand for people to remember when the, their boss or their operating procedure is, or their environment is not right in front of them. How do I make the right decision for the organization? And what is galvanizing me to do that? Really important. Yeah, absolutely. Now, next one. Um, this may sound a bit of a downer, but it's just trying to be realistic. Often as leaders, we say, we sort of can fall into the trap of assuming that because what I've said on the tin is our culture, therefore it is. Um, and the higher up the organization people go, the less they're given direct feedback and the more they can end up operating in a bubble of, well, I've said it, therefore it is. Uh, so I would encourage anybody to, as we talked about traits, just really examine and really be no take notice of all aspects of your culture so you really do understand how it's operating so that you can lead through it and highlight the good bits and try to downplay the, the difficult bits or the weaknesses and i always think of culture in three angles the, the, the strategic piece which is what do i say how do i line things up what do i put on my, my website in my annual report but there are two other aspects that really are, are part of your culture and you really need them lined up one is the social side how do people really get work done? Who do they really turn to when they need advice? What are their networks, their communities, the habits, the norms, the things that we always do it this way around here? Just be alert to those. You would hope that they're what you say on the tin, but are they? And the third um, and final element would be what I call the political side. Who's really making the decisions? Who's influencing those decisions? How are they done? Are they done on a Zoom? Are they done before a Zoom? Are they documented? Are they not? You want all those three elements to line up, but just be really cognizant of what is going on. And I think one of the most important things that we can all do is look in the mirror. Are we behaving to fulfill and um, really underpin the culture we say we want, the culture we say we have, and the culture we say we need? Because 
leaders always cast the biggest shadow on any culture, but now even more than ever, it's like a massive spotlight uh, on it at the moment. So really, really take a look. There's some great examples out there. I always um, Lord Timpson actually uh, on this. James Timpson is, is an outstanding communicator as a leader and takes responsibility. He's direct, he's been on Twitter again this morning. Um, you know, look in the mirror. Are you um, observing and, and acting in the way you say you want others to act? It's certainly a defining time for leadership um, about, you know, there's that iceberg model of, you know, look below the surface and find out what is your culture really like. This is the time where all, every, every company is seeing that exactly at the moment. Absolutely. Um, and it's more than just communication. You know, on the topic of communication, before we talk about those other two points, um, clearly, you know, communication consistency is important. Leaders are really stepping up. Um, there's some fantastic examples of folks. Uh, of leaders starting to use external platforms as well. I see this, you know, Starbucks CEO has written all 200,000 partners on their website talking about defining the mission and values and what he expects. And um, the Slack CEO is using Twitter to communicate. So it's about uh, communication consistency and a bit of certainty. And also about thinking ahead about what manage your message. What are you saying today versus what you might want to say in three months time and managing expectations for people. But actually it's a whole lot more than uh, communications, isn't it, Christy? Yeah, I mean, whenever I um, think about uh, instilling the culture that you need, I look at the whole system. So it is about consistent messaging from the top on repeat, not changing, so that people get into a drumbeat of knowing what's really important. It is about leadership effort and responsibilities we've talked about. It is also lining up your processes and your systems to deliver on that. You know, things need to be um, sort of equitable. If, if you want... Uh, if you want innovation, how are you lining up your processes and your your culture to ensure that 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 innovation is possible, so that there aren't roadblocks standing in the way? It is about um, symbols, recognizing people who are doing the things that you you want to to be done, and it is about everybody in. It's not about just broadcasting from the top and just declaring from the top. It's about getting everybody all those thousand points of light around your organization to do something in their own way to inculcate this culture so it is about a whole system shift i look at it always like tuning an engine if you want a really high performance engine to work at its optimal every little bit has to be lined up if something is out of line it will not perform at its optimum it, that really speaks to the need to join up um, it internal comms brand leadership that kind of um, task force and almost the people that look at culture and actually responsible for the shaping it's now more than ever it's very important absolutely and, and i'd also recognize though that not everybody will be engaged in the similar way or will react in the same way to change or crisis my rule of thumb is one third one third one third i've often found that there are a third of people who really want to be engaged and are all, all they're waiting for is to be ignited and given a task off we go yes i want to do more than my job there are a third of people who tend to um, are, 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 can retreat in crisis or change um, or who even may be disruptive or who may be cynical or negative and that's just maybe the way they are and then there's a group in the middle who seem quite silent um, and are almost waiting for instruction from somebody they trust my advice would be don't always focus on only the negative ones if there's really disruptive people out there then they need to be sort of dealt with tackled whatever but don't spend all our focus on the weak point spend our focus on the middle group who are quite silent but waiting to be maneuvered into the, the, what you want them to do but need to trust it. The engaged lot will be engaged anyway, sort of point and click. Um, but when you look at the media, for example, the media only team seems to, to, to look at the extremes and often too much on the downside. Don't get drawn into focusing on only the weaknesses. Get the silent majority in the middle, the silent third in the middle moving as well. Yeah, it's, a re it's really is a time for active listening and making sure that you've got the channels of communication, people can give feedback and also be ready to respond really quickly and take action on things that you can change. Yeah, uh, and yeah. absolutely. So on this one, um, looking back but moving beyond, you know, we're, we're not going to be stuck here for the next, in exactly the same situation for, you know, months and months and months. It, it will shift. It already has shifted in the last five weeks in terms of how we work, how we think, processes we've got into, um, and focus is shifting. For example, I was on my Swedish board's board meeting this morning at, um, at eight, and uh, already that company is starting to think 
beyond the crisis because it's now into a rhythm of crisis management. Um, I'm seeing, you know, regulators are not sitting there thinking we're only looking at crisis, they're looking beyond. Markets, you only have to look at the Dow Jones, it seems to be looking way beyond. Um, so things will move, uh, cultures are not static, contexts are not static. Um, and I, I, I think we need to, to look beyond, learn lessons from behind and be conscious of today. But just be careful not to get stuck in only the now. Um, I did notice um, an article in Sunday Times yesterday looking at how businesses seem to have shifted more towards this um, sense of care and responsibility, the more, the, the more S and G part of ES and G. Um, but they were asking, you know, how long will the caring last? So we will move, we will shift, but, but try if you can to look back at what we're learning, but also look beyond today. And obviously how we act today is certainly going to be picked apart tomorrow, isn't it? It, it really is. Um, you know, I, I've never seen before in business this expectation around how is this big, big business going to act? How are organisations being equitable? Are bosses taking as much pain, if not more, than their colleagues? And if not, you know, why not? And, and quite right. Um, because fingers will point at the end of this. Everybody will want to look back and say, who did this right? Who did this wrong? Um, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? Um, and, and I have, you know, the starting point for a lot of the world is quite a lot of resentment, actually, over the last few years about executive remuneration, and in some sense, it's quite right as well. Um, and there's, but there is now a wave of expectation of, of equitable treatment. And I think, and not just for remuneration, but how you work with your community, how you work with your partners, your well-being focus with your employees, you know, long-term resilience and mental welfare. So really have a think, what is the narrative you want and need to be told by others about your organization in the future? Because you may not be able to fix it, but you can work right now to think how best we can try and um, manage it so that we, are, that, that we are living true to our culture and that we are managing it. And uh, purpose is being attuned right now. You talked about care and responsibility just before, Kirsty, but I think it's, um, you know, we've talked a lot as a business with our clients about purpose. It's, again, it's been one of those things that, you know, all our big companies and clients are talking about. Um, but some of them, it's actually being attuned right now. You know, the, the societal and community focus is really high. Is all that caring responsibility for communities, people and businesses. So, and even some companies have even shifted their production and changed what they do to become even more purposeful and relevant, such as you know, F1, Airbus, and Rolls always making ventilators. Not core business, but it's about you know, making use of what they have. Um, and then in some are even leaning in to the, towards their mission and their purpose. There's a really nice, um, really nice example of GIFGAP, uh, which is uh, their, their mission is, we believe in community and people and the person, but specifically what the power should rest with them. Um, and what they've done is launched an initiative called the Goodie Bank, which is customers purchase additional minutes, texts and data actually to donate to another customer. So, you know, allowing their customers to have the power to rest with them, well, they've enabled them to do that even more. So it's really nice to see companies kind of leaning in and kind of making more of that. And I guess, you know, why is that important for culture? Because um, I think people really want to rally behind the core. The people like to rally and feel like they're part of something and, and belong. And, I'm mean, actually mobilising into action. We've seen a huge amount of that in all sorts of businesses across the UK at the moment, um, supporting each other in communities. So I'd expect to see quite a bit more of this happening as companies step back and think, gosh, what is our purpose? What are we doing? How, do we, how are we relevant? Yeah, I do think it's been a real time for re reflection as well, uh, and increasingly so. And, and it, it's, it strikes me that an awful lot of the great ideas that we know are out there are all way distributed from beyond the headquarters but they are being sought now more than ever and a question to me is how does that keep going such that the great ideas are always harnessed in because a lot of people way beyond the headquarters of any company are so attuned to the purpose but you know how can that be ignited further if i look at my old alma mater vp and the new ceo there bernard Vooney, um he's he's put this you know 20 2050 net zero challenge out there and it's interesting to see the social media that he's doing and how employees are responding to that with a sense of, you know, we may not know how we're going to get there. There is a huge crisis for the oil and gas industry right now. And perhaps, you know, not before time, some would say. 
um, but you, to see how employees and partners are responding to the messages they're putting out and how they're stepping further in is really interesting um, to observe right now. So the next one we're talking about is um, culture for recovery may not be the same as culture in a crisis or culture for growth. So even though you may have a defined culture, you may know what those strengths and what those traits are, how you are and how your culture needs to be in this environment may need to shift slightly as you move beyond the crisis into recovery and then into how does the company thrive again and then how might it grow or the organization. Um, and I'm not saying rewrite your culture. Um, a great example of this is a financial um, institution I worked with, a Japanese one last year um, and the year before. They had a set of values that were really, really long held, but they were moving out of crisis and into growth. And they, they wanted to have a look at what traits they needed to play up within that cultural set to enable growth, because people had got quite hunkered down. They were waiting for instruction in a crisis mode. So how be really conscious as we move through this what is needed for crisis what is needed for recovery in different mindsets people will after a while get used to hearing instructions working through the values keeping it simple but that may not work for recovery and it won't work for growth so just be really really um really really be mindful mindful of that and uh, the next point we wanted to make was the elastic band is stretched for long enough uh, it won't go back to its original shape. And that's where we are at the moment. Um, having said that, you know, th there is, everybody's asking now, how will we work? What will it mean for culture? What will it mean for people? Um, will things ever be the same again? Has everything, the way of work changed? Will no offices ever be used again? Will no commute ever happen? My point of view on this is some things will shift um, and, and perhaps it's, in timing of commuting or maybe we'll be working more at weekends depending on where people's lives are who knows but bottom line people are social and power is a magnet and there's no getting away from where the boss is some people like to be so i i don't believe everything will shift and uh, i don't believe nothing will shift um, but I, I would encourage any organization to take a look at what's working now that we could you know work for us in the future certainly sitting on various boards the rhythm that we're now working in is very different um, the way we're having communications and conversations is very different and i would encourage us to be thinking about the schedule ahead as to what works we don't always have to get on a train to sit for a day in a meeting space but um i i do think having a think about that way of working and what does it mean for your culture and your strategy in the future is, is worth thinking about now, but, but, but don't fall into that trap of everything will change and nothing will be the same again, because I still, still still think some traits will be, will be very strong. Yeah, there's some, I think there's some really interesting thinking and ideas coming up about what the new workplace looks like, you know, because you know, not, not everything that uh, works online at the moment is going to translate back offline and, and vice versa. And, you know, when we're thinking about what space do we need and what's the configuration of our workplace and do we need more meeting rooms or how does that work, I think, you know, it's going to be really uh, interesting, but quite transformative, I think, for the next mm -hmm. couple of period. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what? Are, so um, does that mean culture eats strategy for lunch? You know, there's that, you know, famous phrase, is it all about culture? What about strategy? Um, I, I have a very strong view that they're actually equal partners. Uh, you, you cannot deliver the strategy you need without uh, the culture to underpin it because businesses are driven by people. Um, you can write all the algorithms you want you can build all the machines you want, but they need maintaining. People have to write algorithms. Bottom line, people run businesses. And um, the way you work, the way you act, the way you behave, the way you think, the, the perceptions you have, the way you decide, they all feed into how you deliver your strategy. So I see them as equal partners. One without the other, you're gonna get what you get, but it won't be what you want and it won't be what you need. Um, so I, I, I do think one of the things to think about is as you're emerging, what new business models, what new markets, what new opportunities, and therefore what new strategies, and therefore how might my culture need to shift to underpin that? Again, culture is never static, the context shifts. That doesn't mean a whole rewrite is required of what your expectations are, but it may need tweaks, or it could be something radically different depending on your organization's context. Um, and, and that feeds into what's your employee value proposition as well and how are you going to communicate that and how do they take part? So um, I, I think that they remain actually absolutely equal partners. I'm hoping that 
equal partners um, moves, the culture piece moves further up for longer in the agenda of the CEO uh, sitting alongside strategy and alongside operations and doesn't start falling down the ranks again. Yeah, I think I mean, that's an interesting point about um, employee value proposition. I think when you look, at, you think about some of the things we've talked about, all those elements mm -hmm. that have changed, we're thinking about purposeful business, care, responsibility, you know, benefits and, you know, holidays, there's all sorts of, the, the whole experience, I guess, has changed for people. And it's maybe a really interesting time to step back and think, well, what does ours need to look like? How do we shape it? How does it go forward? And how is it helping us deliver our business? And also what exactly. kind of people might we need to attract in the future? It might be completely different. Um, really exactly. interesting. Um, uh, I have to apologize, my computer is frozen up and not forwarding. So um, we just had one wrap up slide actually, which was people drive business, don't they? This is, it's obviously, you know, in this period, it's all about people driving the success of business and culture is right at the top, isn't it? It absolutely is. It absolutely is. And for so many of us on this webinar, it always has been. But as I say, my hope is that it actually moves up, uh, literally moves up the agenda um, so that it, it's more often the starting point of a meeting unless the AOB or the 15 minutes in the middle after lunch, before lunch or at the end. Yeah, definitely.